Pseudopod is extruded into this universe from a dimension of purest fear. It's beautiful in its own alien way, but what's to come will unsettle you. Pseudopod episode 688 for February 7th, 2020. The Tunnel Ahead by Alice Glazer. I'm Alex, co-editor of Pseudopod, your host this week. Welcome to our third volume of Weird Science Horror Month. After a number of adventures, Alice Glazer returned to New York in 1958 to begin a career at Esquire magazine, rising to assistant and then associate editor in the 1960s. At Esquire, Glazer solicited articles and stories, some from SF writers including Fritz Leiber, and contributed articles of her own. Her best known, an account of a week spent in India with Allen Ginsberg, appeared in 1963 as Back on the Open Road for Boys. The Tunnel Ahead, published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in 1961, is her only known work of speculative fiction. The Tunnel Ahead is one of the most frequently anthologized of modern SF stories. In 2016, Norwegian filmmaker Andre Orderval, director of the critically acclaimed Troll Hunter, yeah, that guy, released a short film adaptation of it that went on to win the prize for best overall short film at the Calgary International Film Festival. So on to our narrator. New York Times best-selling author Alethea Contas is a princess, a storm chaser, and a geek. Alethea narrates stories for Escape Pod, Pseudopod, and Cast of Wonders, and we're hoping to hear her on Podcastle soon. She contributes regular book reviews to NPR. She has five stories appearing in anthologies in 2020, including Once Upon a Ghost, releasing very soon on February 17th. Find out more at alethiacontas.com. Now, perform your stretching exercises, settle back, and listen patiently. Because we have a story for you, and we promise you, it's true. The Tunnel Ahead by Alice Glazer Read by Alethea Contis The floor of the Topolino was full of sand. There was sand in Tom's undershorts, too, and damp sand running between his toes. Damn it, he thought. Here they build you six-lane highways right down to the ocean, a giant 300-car turntable to keep traffic moving over the beach. Efficiency and organization and mechanization and cooperation, and what does it get you? Sand. And inside the car, in spite of the air conditioning, the sour smell of sun-dried salt water. Tom's muscles ached with their familiar cramp. He ran his hands uselessly around the steering wheel, wishing he had something to do, or that there were room to stretch in this tiny car, then felt instantly ashamed of his antisocial wish. Naturally, there was nothing for him to do, because the drive, as on all highways, was set at automatic. That was the law. And although he had to sit hunched over so that his knees were drawn nearly to his chin and the roof of the car pressed down on the back of his neck like the lid of a box, and his four kids crammed into the rear seat seemed to be breathing down his shirt collar, well, that was something you simply had to adjust to. And besides, the Topolino had all the five-foot wheelbase the law allowed, so there was nothing to complain about. Besides, it hadn't been a bad day, all things considered. Five hours to cover the forty miles out to the beach. Then, of course, a couple of hours waiting in line at the beach for their turn in the water. The trip home was taking a little longer. It always did. The tunnel, too, was unpredictable. Say, ten o'clock for getting home? Pretty good time. As good a way as any of killing a leisure day, he guessed. Sometimes there seemed to be an awful lot of leisure time to kill. Jeanie, in the seat behind him, was staring through the windshield. Her hair, almost as fair as the kids, was pulled back into pigtails. And although she was pregnant again, she didn't look very much older than she had ten years before. But she had stopped knitting, and her mind was on the tunnel. He could always tell. Ouch! Something slammed into the back of Tom's neck, and he ducked forward, hanging his forehead on the windshield. Hey! He half-turned and clutched at the spade that four-year-old Patty was waving. I swimmed, she announced, blue eyes round. I swimmed good and I didn't hit nobody. Anybody, Tom corrected. 
he confiscated the spade, thinking tiredly that swim these days meant dread water, all there was room to do in the crowded bathing area. Jeanie had turned, too, and was glowing at her daughter, but Tom shook his head. Over and out, he said briefly. He knew a car ride was an extra strain on kids, and Lord knew he saw them seldom enough, what with their school shifts and play shifts and his own job shift. But his brood was going to be properly brought up. See a sign of extroversion? Squelch it at the beginning. That was his theory. Saved them a lot of pain later on. Jeanie leaned forward and pressed a dashboard button. The tranquilizer drawer slid open. Jeanie selected a pink one. But by the time she had turned around, Patty had subsided with her hands folded patiently in her lap and her eyes fixed on the rear seat TV screen. Jeanie sighed and slipped the pill into Jeanie's half-open mouth anyway. The other three hadn't spoken for hours, which of course was as it should be. Jeanie had fed them a purposely heavy lunch in the car. Steak a pop and a hot steaming bowl of rehydrated algae soup from the thermos, and they had each had an extra dose of tranquilizers for the trip. Six-year-old David, who was having a particularly hard time learning to introvert, was watching the TV screen and breathing hard. David, his firstborn son, born in the supermarket delivery booth in the year 2100, on the 3rd of April, at 8.32 in the morning. The year the population of the United States hit the billion mark, and the fifth child to arrive in the booth that morning. But his own son... The toe-headed twins, Susan and Patty, sat upright and watched the screen with expressions of great seriousness on their faces. And the baby, two-year-old Betsy, had her fat legs stuck straight out in front of her and was obviously going to be asleep in minutes. The car crawled forward at its allotted ten miles an hour, just one in a ribbon of identical bright bubble cars like candy buttons that stretched along the new Pulaski Skyway under a setting sun. The distance between them, strictly rationed by auto drive, never changed. Tom felt the dull ache of tension settled behind his eyes. All of his muscles were protesting now, with individual stabs of cramp. He glanced apologetically at Jeanie, who disliked sports, and switched on the dashboard TV. Third game in the World Series, and the game had already begun. Malinkovsky on red. Malinkovsky moved a checker and sat back. The cameras moved to Saito, on black. It was going to be a good game. Faster than most. They were less than a mile from the tunnel when the line of cars came to a halt. Tom said nothing for a minute. It might just be an accident, or even somebody driving illegally on manual, out of line. Another minute passed. Jeannie's hands were tense on the yellow blanket she was knitting. It was a definite halt. Jeanie regarded the motionless lines of cars, frowning a little. I'm glad it's happening now. That gives us a better chance of getting through, doesn't it? Her question was rhetorical, and Tom felt his usual stir of irritation. Jeanie was an intelligent girl. He couldn't have loved her so much otherwise. But explaining the laws of chance to her was hopeless. The tunnel averaged ten closings a week. All ten could happen within seconds of each other, or in the hour or not at all, on a given day. That was how things were. The closing now affected their own chance of getting through not one iota. Jeanie said thoughtfully, We'll be caught sometime, Tom. He shrugged without answering. Whatever might happen in the future, they were obviously going to be held up for a good half hour now. David was wriggling a little, his face apologetic. Can I get out, Daddy, if the tunnel's closed? I ache. Tom bit his lip. He could sympathize as well as anyone, remembering the cramped misery of the years when his own body was growing and all he wanted to do was run fast, just run, headlong, any place. Kids. Extras, all of them. Maybe you could get away with that kind of wildness back in the 20th century when there were no crowds and plenty of space. But not these days. David was just going to have to learn to sit still like everybody else. David had begun to flex his muscles rhythmically. Passive exercise, it was called. One of the new pseudo-sports that took up no room. And it was very scientifically taught in the play shifts. 
Tom eyed his son enviously. Great to be in condition like that. No need to wait in line to get your ration of gym time when you could depend on yourself like that. Dad, no kidding! Now I gotta go! David wriggled in his seat again. Well, that sounded valid. Tom looked through the windshield. The thousands of cars in sight were still motionless, so he swung the door open. Luckily, there was a chemo john a few yards away, and only a short line in front of it. David slid quickly out of the car. Tom watched him start to stretch his arms over his head, released from the low roof, then sheepishly remember decent behavior and tighten into the approved intro walk. He's getting tall, Tom thought, with a sudden accession of hopelessness. He had been praying that David would inherit Jeannie's height instead of his own six feet. The more area you took up, the harder everything was, and it was getting worse. Tom had noticed that already. People would sometimes stare resentfully at him in the street. There was an Italian family in the bright blue Topolino behind his own. They, too, had a car full of children. Two of the boys, seeing David in front of the chemo john, burst out and dashed into the line behind him. The father was grinning. Tom caught his eye and looked away. He remembered seeing them pass a large bottle of expensive reclaimed water around the car, the whole family guzzling it as though water grew on trees. Extros. That whole family. Almost criminal the way people like that were allowed to run loose and increase the discomfort of everyone else. Now the father had left the car, too. He had curly black hair. He was very plump. When he saw Tom watching him, he grinned broadly, waved towards the tunnel, and lifted his shoulders with a kind of humorous resignation. Tom drummed on the wheel. The extras were lucky. You'd never catch them worrying unduly about the tunnel. They had to get the kids out of the city once in a while like everybody else. The tunnel was the only way in and out, so they shrugged and took it. Besides, there were so many rules and regulations now that it was hard to question them anymore. You can't fight City Hall. The extras would neither dread the trip the way Jeannie did, nor... Tom's fingers were rigid on the wheel. He clamped down hard on the thought in his mind. He had been about to say, needed it. The way he did. David emerged from the chemo john and slid back in his seat. The cars had just begun to move. In a moment, they had resumed their crawl. On the left of the Skyway, they were coming to the development that was already called facetiously Beer Can Mountain. So far, there was nothing there except mountainous stacks of shiny bricks, the metal bricks that had once been tin cans and would soon be constructed into another badly needed housing development, probably with even lower ceilings and thinner walls. Tom winced involuntarily. Even at home, in a much older residential section, the ceilings were so low that he could never stand up without bending his head. Individual area space was being cut down and cut down, all the time. On the flatlands to the right of the Skyway stretched mile after garish mile of apartment buildings, interspersed with gasoline stations and parking lots. And beyond these flatlands were the suburbs of Long Island, cement-floored and stacked with gay-colored skyscrapers. Here, as they approached the city, the air was raucous with the noise of transistor radios and TV sets. Privacy and quiet had disappeared everywhere, of course, but this was a lower-class unit and so noisy that the blare penetrated even the closed windows of the car. The immense apartment buildings, cement block and neon lit, came almost to the edge of the skyway, with ramps between them at all levels. The ramps, originally built for cars, were swarming now with people returning from their routine job shifts, or from marketing, or just carrying on the interminable business of leisure time. They looked pretty apathetic, Tom thought. You couldn't blame them. There was so much security that none of the work anybody did was really necessary, and they knew it. Their jobs were probably even more monotonous and futile than his own. All he did on his own job shift was verify figures in a ledger then copy them into another ledger. Time-killing, like everything else. These people looked as though they didn't care, one way or the other. But as he watched, there was a quick scuffle in the crowd, a sudden brief outbreak of violence. One man's shoe had scraped the heel of a woman ahead of him. She turned and swung her shopping bag, scraping a bloody gash down his cheek. 
He slammed his fist at her stomach. She kicked. A man behind them rammed his way past, his face contorted. The pair separated, both muttering. Around them, other knots of people were beginning to mutter. The irritation was spreading, as it seemed to do from time to time, as though nobody wanted anything so much as the chance to strike out. Jeannie had seen the explosion, too. She gasped and turned away from the window, looking quickly back at the children, who were all asleep now. Tom pulled one of her pigtails gently. The skyline loomed ahead of them, one vast, unified glass-walled cube of Manhattan. Light rays shot from it into the sunset. The spots of foliage that were the carefully planned block gardens, one at each level of the 98 floors of the unit, glowed dark green. Tom, as he always did, blessed the foresight that had put them there. Each one of his children had been allotted his or her weekly hour on the grass and a chance to play near the tree. There was even a zoo on each level, not the kind of elaborate one they had in Washington and London and Moscow, of course, but at least it had a cat and a dog and a really large tank of goldfish. When he came down to it, luxuries like that almost made up for the crowds and the noise and the tiny rooms and feeling that there was never quite enough air to breathe. They were just outside the tunnel. Jeannie had put her knitting down. She was looking intensely ahead, but as though she were listening rather than looking. In spite of his own arguments, Tom felt his fingers thudding on the dashboard. On the TV screen, Melankovsky triumphantly moved a king. They had reached the tunnel entrance. Jeannie was silent. She glanced at her watch irrationally. Tom pressed the tranquilizer button and the drawer shot out, but Jeannie shook her head. I hate this, Tom. I think it's an absolutely lousy idea. Her voice sounded almost savage, for Jeannie, and Tom felt a little shocked. It's the fairest thing, he argued. You know it perfectly well. Jeannie's mouth had set in a stubborn line. I don't care. There must be another way. This is the only fair way, Tom said again. We take our chances along with everybody else. His own heart was pounding now, and his hands felt cold. It was the feeling he always had on entering the tunnel, and he never decided whether it was dread or elation or both. He was no longer bored. He glanced at the children on the back seat. David was watching television again and gnawing on a fingernail. The three little ones were still asleep, sitting up as they had been taught to do, hands folded properly in their laps. Three blind mice. The tunnel was echoing and cold. White light slipped off the white tile walls that were clean and polished and airtight. Wind rushed past, sounding as though the car were moving faster than it actually was. The Italian family was still behind them, following at a constant speed. Huge fans were set into the tunnel ceiling. Their roar reverberated over the roar of the giant invisible air conditioning units, over the slow wind of the moving cars. Jeannie had put her head down on the seat back, as though she were asleep. The cars stopped for an instant, started again. Tom wondered if Jeannie felt the same vivid thrill that he felt. Then he looked at the line of her mouth and saw the fear. The tunnel was 8,500 feet long. Each car took up seven feet, bumper to bumper. Allow five feet between cars. About 700 cars in the tunnel, then. More than 3,000 people. It would take each car about 15 minutes to go through. Their car was halfway through now. They were three-quarters of the way through. Automatic signal lights were flashing at them from the catwalk under the tunnel roof. Tom's foot moved the gas pedal before he remembered the car was set on automatic. It was an atavistic gesture. His hands and feet wanted a job to do. His body, for a minute, wanted to control the direction of its plunge. It was the way he always felt in the tunnel. They were almost through. His scalp felt as though tiny ants were running along the hairs. He moved his toes, feeling the scratch of sand on the nerves between them. He could see the far end of the tunnel. Maybe two minutes more. They stopped again. A car somewhere ahead had swerved out of line to search for the right exit. Once out of the tunnel, it was legal to switch back to manual drive 
since it was necessary to pick the right exit out of ten, and all too easy to find herself carried to the top level of Manhattan unit before finding a place to turn off. Tom's hand drummed at the wheel. The maverick ahead had edged back into line. They started movement again. They picked up speed. They were out of the tunnel. Jeanie picked up her knitting and shook it sharply. Then she dropped it, as though it had bitten her fingers. A bell was clanging over their heads. Not too loud, but clear. Just behind their rear bumper, a gate swung smoothly into place. Jeanie turned back to look at the space behind them where the Italian family in the bright blue car, and others, had been. There were no cars there now. She turned back to stare whitely through the windshield. Tom was figuring. Two minutes for the ceiling sprays to work. Then the 700 cars in the tunnel would be hauled out and emptied. Ten minutes for that, say. He wondered how long it was supposed to take for the giant fans to blow the cyanide gas away. Depopulation without discrimination, they called it at election time. Nobody would ever admit voting for it, but almost everybody did. Allowed you had to rationalize. It was the fairest way to do a necessary thing. But in the unadmitted places of your mind, you knew it was more than that. A gamble, the one unpredictable element in the long, dreary process of survival. A game. Russian roulette. A game you played to win? Or maybe to lose? The answer didn't matter, because the tunnel was excitement. The only excitement left. Tom felt, suddenly, remarkably wide awake. He switched to manual drive and angled the round nose of the Topolino over to the fourth-level exit. He began to whistle between his teeth. Beach again next, sweetie, huh? Jeannie's eyes were on his face. Defensively, he added, Good for all of us. Get out of the city. Get a little fresh air once in a while. He nudged her and pulled a pigtail gently, with affection. This is dystopia wearing the brave smile of post-scarcity utopia. The makeup cracks around those plastic smiles and the panicked glances to the side to see if anyone else is willing to acknowledge that they're suppressing the same scream. How far do we need to step to get to a world where extroversion is the disadvantaged mode? It feels like the family in the story was riding in a slightly less comfortable smart car. For those of you not familiar with this, it's a line of microcars and subcompacts released by Daimler AG. This brand is now officially dead in the United States as its last model retired at the end of 2019. I think this is less a repudiation of their snug size, but instead the exceptionally limited range of the electric model, compounded by the American propensity for having a long commute. So it's only a matter of time and battery technology evolution before something small makes it back into the American market. My favorite doomed microcar is the Elio, which is basically an enclosed motorcycle. Rather than having a two-seat vehicle place the passengers side by side, they put them in front of each other. Effectively, a coupe for introverts. They never quite have been able to make it to production, and the slingshot has stolen some of their emotional market space, although that model's still not enclosed. There's an opportunity for a smaller vehicle like this, particularly as our culture moves away from more vehicle ownership and identity culture and towards transportation as a service. One detail in this story that made me stop to think, as a traffic nerd, was the mandated pace speed. There's a balance point that optimizes the number of cars you can move through a section of road over a given period of time. You may be surprised to find that that number is 35 miles an hour. But as cars speed up, the space between them gets larger because they need more distance to be able to stop. The larger gaps between cars results in fewer cars processed through that same space at a given time. That said, the 10 mile per hour speed in the story may be to allow for the gates at either end of the tunnel to close with minimal fuss. Or maybe this society is just mandating wasting time. There are hints dropped of that throughout the story. What punched me about this story was the contrast between the moments where you see that they absolutely load this, and yet it's the most exciting portion of their week, and that maybe, just this once, if they're lucky, they'll be snuffed out. Nihilism at its best. We hope you enjoy the rest of our Weird Science Horror Showcase.
We would like to offer our congratulations to Gordon B. White for making it to the preliminary ballot for the Stokers with Birds of Passage. For your listening and reading pleasure, we reprinted this as episode 633 last year. HWA members who can vote for this, we encourage you to consider making this one of your selections, as we think it's a darn good story. Subscribers at the $5 a month level get access to our extrusions feed. Each month we release a bonus story, and this month's coordinates with our weird science horror theme and brings you The Red Brain by Donald Wandre. This is read to you by the incomparable Dr. Hal, who is the master of church secrets for the Church of the Subgenius. Pseudopod is part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Theme music is by permission of Anders Mango. Pseudopod differentiates between older fairy tales, which predate the rise of the merchant class, and those which come after it. According to some, those older versions of the form use the language of the fantastic to articulate questions about human experience that demand to be asked, explored, whereas the newer tales have their intent providing the simple lessons in conformity for the children of a rising middle class. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.